Okay, everybody. Um, I hope you all had a chance to take a short breather. I know it's it's pretty intense. A lot of material went through. Um, I'm sorry if it was a bit too fast at certain positions. I'll try to you know adjust the speed a little bit for the second half. So we kind of ended on a bit of a cliffhanger. So we actually generated all that cool output and. As you might have seen, as this comment like finished in a few seconds, was basically that it generated a lot of output files. And between them, we can definitely spot a few visualizations, which are those QZV files. So those would be super interesting to look at probably, but we actually haven't really talked that much about better diversity and how to visualize it. So let's get a grip on that a little bit first and then we'll go back. So we have our tree, we put that in. Um, and now we also have our better diversity estimate. So that was calculated based on the tree using the unifrac distances, like we introduced them, um, and using actually the weighted version as well, which takes abundances into account as well, along with you know phylogenetic similarity. So what does better diversity actually look like? Like I said, it's a distance measure between samples. So for every pair of samples, you essentially get a distance assigned to it. If the values are higher, that means samples are further apart. If it's zero, which for instance is the distance between a sample and itself will always be zero. It means it's exactly the same um, in terms of composition. So like we might get like a better diversity matrix like that. And now one thing we might want to do is to actually visualize that. And without going really too much into the mathematical details, like I think the intuition is probably a bit more important. Um, and that is like, what we essentially want to do is to represent that into like a 2D or a 3D plot. And essentially what we want to do is we want to put them into a plot where each point is actually one of the samples and the arrangement of the sample should be very consistent with that distance matrix. So for instance, if we look at the distance matrix for the three samples here that I put in as an example, you see that sample two and sample one have a really high distance. So they should be far apart in any visualizations that we do. Sample three and sample one, that's fairly close, right? So those should be somewhat close. And sample three and sample two are also somewhat close. So in any good visualization, we should actually get like a case where sample one and sample two are far apart and sample three is close with sample one and sample two. So how, what would be like a good way to do that? Well, let's look at a few examples. So for instance, the first one here, like we can look at it like sample one is like that blue dot here. It seems to be fairly close to sample two. Well, that's actually the opposite of what our better diversity matrix says, right? It says they are really far apart. So that's kind of not perfect. And then if we also look at sample three here, sample three should be um, fairly close to sample one and should also be fairly close to sample two. So, well, it's actually far away from both, right? So that's not a good projection. So let's look maybe at another example here. So here we definitely have like sample one and sample two being pretty far apart. Um, sample three and sample two are actually pretty close. And that kind of is consistent with that distance matrix here because actually the closest two points. And then sample three is, you know, it's somewhat closer to sample one than it was before in the other projection. That's still pretty far away. So that's definitely better. It's more consistent with that distance matrix. And all about those embeddings methods actually are about doing that. Say, like their goal is to take the distance matrix and arranging points on that plot in a way that is very consistent with that distance matrix. Um, and a principal coordinate analysis is kind of the best linear projection of that. So it kind of means if the only thing I can do to that distance matrix are kind of normal linear um, transformations to actually get um, to something that looks somewhat like that, then this is actually ends up being the principal contour coordinate analysis. It's the best possible method to do so. Um, one thing that is obvious here, and you kind of see that from that matrix a bit, is sometimes it's not perfectly possible to do so in like low dimensional space. So for instance, if you have hundreds of samples, you can get inconsistency where it's kind of hard to arrange it. So for instance, here we had that case where we said that um, sample two must be really far away from sample one, but then at the same time, sample three had to be close to both of them. That's kind of a bit, you know, hard to do, right? Because if I have to separate those two, the blue and the red point by a lot, but at the same point, I have to make them both be really close to the green point. That's kind of a bit impossible on a 2D plot. So there's always a bit of a loss of information in that process. Um, 
So sometimes you actually want to get a grip on that as well. So in a principal coordinate analysis, that loss of information can be quantified by the percentage of variance that is explained just by that particular 2D or 3D projection. So each of those axes, for instance, the X axis might explain 20% of the variance in the distance matrix. The Y axis might explain another 10%. The third dimension might explain five. Usually they kind of go down and like you might actually need a lot of dimension to really represent the distance matrix perfectly well. So there's always a bit of a loss of information that has to be accounted for but often that's a bit more intuitive anyways because it's hard to look at the huge you know it's kind of easy for those three samples but looking at a hundred samples at a matrix at that and understanding what's going on is much harder than looking at a projection like that and we can like, kind of look at that like visually by actually you know opening some of those visualizations so let's go through that again so what has happened when we ran that comment so generated a lot of visualizations and all generated them in a subfolder called diversity, which is in the materials folder. So if you open that up, it may be you know, refresh in case you haven't done so before. Um, there's a lot of files here. Uh, basically, they're kind of named by the distance matrix they used um, and then kind of what they did. We're actually only interested in the QZV files here. Um, and we might actually start with a weighted unifrac emperor QZV file, which is a pen ultimate file in that list because that uses the weighted unifrac distances. So it kind of takes everything into account that we have done. So it takes phylogenetic similarity into account. Are those empty consequence very similar or different? It takes the abundances between samples into account. And then a projected emperor is essentially a plugin in Shime 2 that creates those visualizations like we have seen. So let's download that again by clicking on the three little dots next to it, clicking download, waiting for it to download. It can sometimes take a little bit while that circle fills up and then it suddenly appears. Um, and then again, I will open up view.chime.org. Oops. Remove that part from it. And then I can add this file again. So I use this whited unifrac emperor.qzv file here. I open it up and it looks well, pretty nifty. So we kind of get that projection. At first, we only see three axes, but you can actually rotate it. It's a three dimensional plot. Each dot here is a single sample, and those are arranged, like I said, with principal coordinate analysis in a way that they're really consistent with the distances from the better diversity. So points that have low better diversity to another point, they are basically close to each other. And we do see some clustering going on here. And then on the axis itself, you actually see the percentage of variance explained annotated as well. So that first separation axis here explains like almost 40% of the variance, the second one 21, and it's usually additive. So those two axes together explain something around, you know, almost 60% of the total variance. That's pretty good. Like, you know, we had, 15 samples here. So for a perfect embedding, you need up to 15 dimensions. We did it in two here. And then if we take in the third dimension into account with the third axis, we actually go to almost 75% of the variance. So three fourths of the total variance is explained. That's pretty good agreement. Um, so now we actually might be interested since we added in the metadata now, but that should have been used somewhere. And we can actually color the points based on certain conditions. So for instance, I now have all these things from my, um, metadata file. And one thing that might be interested is the source, which actually tells us which environment it came from. And now we will see the points actually colored by the particular environments they came from. Um, so one thing you can see that ocean is somewhat separated here on the bottom. They're still quite different from each other, but still they're in their own group. Uh, the human microbiome definitely is also kind of different, but there's some surprises going on here. So if we look, for instance, here, we have like three clusters, which you know, they cluster with each other samples, but also kind of pretty close to each other. And one is the cenotes, the sinkholes uh, in Yucatan, and then also the soil. And that, that kind of makes sense. Like cenotes are embedded in almost like, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's not exactly soil since it's still water, but it's like fresh water. It's surrounded by a lot of soil and there's actually plants often growing around the cenote and you have like a lot of life going on in that ecosystem as well. So you wouldn't be too surprised that that maybe, you know, is actually kind of somewhat embedded between ocean and the soil sample because it's kind of like a mixture environment between like soil usually is also close to fresh water. So you wouldn't really expect it to be completely similar to an ocean sample. But then we also see the honeybee microbiome here. And that one is actually closer to a sinkhole um, than it is to the human gut microbiome. Um, so we kind of see that that's kind of already some insight we're getting here. And, you know, 
intuitively it seems like incorrect like why should like one gut microbiome from one animal be that much different from another animal but then they're fairly different um lifestyles and also diets um it's very controlled the honey gut honey bee gut microbiome is pretty different from the human gut microbiome um it's actually a very controlled microbiome usually just um uh, contains a few species so you actually see that there's quite some variation going on here. And you can actually, you know, color it by different things as well if you wanted to, um, like environment. So you do see some certain information here, how your different the composition of the environments kind of stack up to each other. You definitely see that ocean and the human gut microbiome are kind of outliers. They're fairly different from every other sample in those groups. So that's for the um, the better diversity visualization. And that's kind of nice, it gives us some information. Um, we might also be actually be interested in kind of getting some really hard numbers on that. So we're still like, you know, those separations might be fairly random. We only have like a few samples here. So are those separations that we see visually, are they actually really significant? Like, um, can we actually, you know, assign some statistic measure of um, like certainty to it? And that kind of brings us into the idea of statistical analysis. And we said for alpha diversity, it's fairly simple. We can treat it like we would any covariate, like if we do like a longitudinal study. So for each sample, we have a single value. We can compare them by t-tests or and Whitney U test, like any um, test that um, like kind of compares some different distributions. Then for better diversity, it's definitely a bit more complicated because we have that weird distance matrix. And so how do we can, how can we actually align that with like certain information we have about the environment. So let's talk about that a little bit. So we have the visualization, that's nice, but now we actually want to test, we want to see if that separation we see in, um, in the better diversity matrix is actually real. Like is it, or doesn't we have at least a lot of confidence that that's a pretty you know significant separation we observe. And how do we do that? Well. One thing you could imagine is if you have that particular plot, you can kind of check if the centroids of those groups are kind of very different. So like if we look at those clouds of points for new different environments, do they overlap a lot? Or it's very fairly separated. Um, but there's also a way to really test it directly from the actual better diversity matrix, which is nice because as we said, like those projections actually don't conserve all of the information in the data. So we, they might be slightly imperfect. So that is kind of embedded into a certain type of regression, which is called permanova. So permanova means permuted manova, and manova means a multivariate analysis of variance. Um, so basically, you might have heard of an own ANOVA, which is like an just an analysis of variance. So you would have like a single outcome variable, like for instance, it could be um, how much salt there's in a certain environment, and you have like a second one, which is a pH, and you might want to see like how much of the variance in the in pH, uh, in, in salt levels can be explained by pH, for instance, that would be an A over here. Since we have like a lot of different distances, we actually have not only one value, but we have the distance from each of the samples to each other sample, it's multivariate. So we have multiple values that we actually want to regress again. It still looks fairly simple to a normal regression. So we can kind of take those distances and plug them into a normal manover and then do it. The problem is that we do get into some problems with like normality and heterogeneity here. Those are not Euclidean distances. It's like some weird, you know, defined unifrac distance. It's not, can't really have, like it doesn't really have all the properties of a Euclidean distance, for instance. Um, if you look at the distribution of these distances, they're often not normally distributed. So they actually have higher variance than you would expect. So you kind of make like bad predictions if you um, would actually um, assume normality. The one trick that you can do is actually you can permute it. Like you can actually say, usually you have to specify a null hypothesis as a specific statistical distribution, but you can also do what is called a permutation test where you actually say, okay, let's assume that all of those distances in the multivariate model are somehow related to a covariate. For instance, we could say the environments they came from. So if I want to generate data from a data set where the environment actually does not distinguish those distances, what I could do is I can take basically the values that I have for the environment and just scramble them up. 
So instead of actually running the test with original data, I run it with artificial data where we have actually reassigned the environment each sample came from. If sample one came from the honey gut microbiome, I randomly sample a new environment for it. I do that for all of them. And I generate data where, well, that doesn't look like our original data anymore. Like now the, the um, assignment of the source um, like what environment that sample came from is completely random. And I do that a lot of times. I scramble that, I scramble that again. I do that a thousand times and I get a lot of different values. So I can basically calculate F values, which kind of tell us how good that fit is just from that badly specified data, like the data that doesn't look like the real data. And that gives me a background distribution of kind of what it would look like if you know that assignment weren't actually real. And then I compare to the real data and I can see what happens. Is that particular goodness of fit value much higher in the real data than it is with that scrambled data? Is it really close or even lower? If it is close or even lower, I would basically say, well, that data looks like data with you know, randomly assigned environments. So it doesn't seem to explain better diversity that much, um, but might be also much higher. And that kind of gives you that particular assumption. Uh, that gives you that particular um, p-value and you can basically derive the p-value just by seeing is you know um, for instance if i do a thousand permutations and 10 of those are basically have a higher f value than my actual data then i would say well the you know the probability to generate my particular observed f value with you know my null hypothesis data which is the scrambled data is 10 out of thousand so the p-value would be one over 100. And you can do that, and that works pretty well to kind of assign significance um, to those separations. And it actually uses a full better diversity metrics and not some kind of projection. So that's really nice. So we ran the, the um, diversity analysis. So let's actually look at it and um, let's actually run the statistics for it as well. So we generated all of that. We actually have the distance matrices in here. So we have like weighted unifrac distance matrix. Um, we have a lot of other ones as well. Um, and those are all just different versions. Um, Jacquard, for instance, would be a good example of a distance matrix where you only look if they definitely, uh, if they only overlap in the organisms that are present in a particular sample, that wouldn't really take the abundance into account. Um, we also have the break Curtis, for instance, for better diversity. That would be a metric that doesn't take the phylogenetic similarity of the sequences into account. It actually doesn't use the trees that we built before. It would actually just check if there's similar organism in the sample, if the abundances are similar. So we can use like any of those. Um, and maybe we start with alpha diversity. Like we said, we can basically compare that. <clears throat> and that's the first thing we might want to look at. We want to look at if certain environments here have, you know, higher ecological diversity. Um, than others. <clears throat> we can do that um, with the diversity plugin as well. And it has that alpha group significance test, which basically just runs, you know, a significant test for different groups. We will use the Shannon index here. So that's kind of the diversity metrics that we pull out. We use again our metadata file because we want to compare it with groups. So we have to provide that information. And we again save it as a visualization called alpha groups, which will do the statistical tests. So if you've done it, uh, if you do that, it will generate that particular out output file, alpha groups QZB. So it will refresh it here um, and it will actually turn up on top of the diversity folder. Again, we can download that. Might take a little bit. At some point, it's downloaded. So let's go back to the main visualization page by clicking on the time to view. And let's open that up as well. Okay, you see it for each single sample. There's definitely a lot of variation going on. Some samples use a similar barcode. We definitely don't want to compare different sequencing barcodes. Let's maybe go back again to the source, which is environments it came from. And that looks a bit more interesting. So what we see here is that soil has by far the highest diversity index here. It's like a Shannon index of around eight to nine, which is really high. Um, human microbiomes usually tend to be around six, and we see that here as well. That's like a good reference. And we see that the ocean is actually a little bit less diverse than the human gut microbiome, but pretty close. So that's like very similar diversities here, whereas the soil is much higher. The honeybee gut microbiome, like I said, is usually um, only colonized by a few distinct species. So you actually don't have that much uh, richness there, and you also don't have that much alpha diversity, much lower. And then the cenote, we see actually quite a variation that ranges from you know almost a four to three Shannon index up to eight or nine. So it's definitely depending on where that's sampled. And that has to do with that those um, cenotes that are used here are actually from different regions in Yucatan. So there's some geographical variation here as well. 
And then you actually get a statistical test. Chime 2 will be smart enough to choose the correct test. So for instance, in this case, it actually realized that we're not comparing only two groups, since in our source environments there's several. Um, and it chooses the Kruskal Wallace test, which basically tests if um, data from several groups kind of have come from the same distribution, so different distributions. They look fairly different here. So it gives us, in this case, a p-value of 0 0.04. So that would be like, you know, just on the verge of what we usually use as a cutoff, or if you don't use a cutoff, it tells you that there isn't, you know, under the null hypothesis, observing that particular data wouldn't be that probable. So you can kind of see it here. And you can also see a little bit like the, the pairwise tests where it actually compares not only um, like the pairwise group. So you could say that, for instance, okay, if we compare the Cenote and the honeybee microbiome, what happens? You actually get a non-significant p-value here. And then also corrects for multiple testing, which gives you the true value if you only want to compare two. So for instance, we said that honey, the ocean and honey, the human microbiome look like they have pretty similar alpha diversity here. Um, we could check that out. Um, and actually, in our case, it doesn't give us at least a corrected p-value that's significant, but you do see since it has lower variance, it's actually not that easy. You actually have to take that into account as well. You can also look at, for instance, variables. For instance, we could look at samples that are taken from a saline and non-saline environment. So ocean you know, has a lot of salt in it, for instance. We can compare those. We actually see that you know, we have a lot of variation in the non-saline environments because that's basically bundles all of the gut microbiome sample, honeybee and human into one group. And now it would only compare the two of them. And you actually see it's, for instance, deemed as not significant. So they're fairly, you know, they would, they would be expected under null hypothesis where everything is generated only from one distribution. So that gives you like some hard numbers and statistics you can actually use to compare those groups. And we can do something similar also and run the permanova for the better diversity to actually see, you know, how much of the inter-sample distance is actually explained by those covariates, like for instance, the source the sample came from. And that is run again with like the diversity plugin. And it has like a, an action called Adonis. Adonis is the name of an algorithm that runs a permanova. Um, and it will take on a distance matrix now, not an alpha diversity measure. And we will use again the weighted unifrac. You can also test it with other, other distance matrices. Again, we will generate some metadata, but this time we actually have to provide a formula, which in most cases can be fairly simple. It can be just the name of the covariate where you actually wanna um, test for statistical significance. In this case, we will test for the source, which is the environment the samples came from. And then again, we do this with two threads and we generate a permanova output, which actually already finished. So we can do the same thing here, download the visualization, look at it in the online portal. And it gives us something very similar. We actually get just a summary of the particular tests that were run. So we kind of see that the source, it says us it has four degrees of freedom. That's because degrees of freedom is usually one less than the actual number of groups. So we have five different groups, that's four degrees of freedom. Then some metrics like the sum of squares that we get from there, we get that particular F value. And we also get the R squared again. The R squared is again the fraction of explained variance. Um, you might have remembered that the first few axes and the P to A seem to explain about like 71%. Um, here we actually explain 77% of the entire variance in the distance matrix with that one variable, which is the source, the environment it came from. So that's a pretty high fraction. Most of the variance, like between most of the intersample distances, are indeed explained only by the source they came from. Basically, that drives those distances. And you get the p value here, which is that permutation p value. It cannot be smaller than 0 0.001 in that case because we only ran 1,000 permutations. So in the best possible case, our F value was larger than all of those. And it takes like one pseudo count into account. So that will be the minimum P value, but it, it would be very significant here. So there's definitely a large fraction of the variance that's explained here. There's about 22% of the variance in the better diversity matrix that is not explained by that. So, so that's like driven by other factors. That's how you can interpret that. So that gives you like some hard statistical test on the very obvious separation that we saw in that projection where like all the points did definitely look like they would separate by the environment. Awesome.
So now we kind of have already generated a few insights. We have compared the environments by only by the composition of the microbiome of the particular environment. Um, we have seen, you know, gotten some like unexpected results. The honeybee gut microbiome, for instance, is closer to the cenotis thing called in Mexico than it is to the human gut microbiome. Um, which is definitely interesting. We definitely saw a few things that we would have been would have expected. Um, ocean as a very saline environment is its microbial composition is definitely very different from other environments, specifically from the human gut microbiome, for instance. But it is somewhat, you know, closer to the cenotis and the soil samples than, for instance, the human gut microbiome is. So let's go back to our presentations. Um, but now, like maybe, I don't know, maybe you have waited for that since the beginning. Like we, we got those amplicant sequence variants. And I mean, we definitely want to know what organisms that actually are. We, we see that there seems to be different compositions of organisms, but what are the actual organisms that differ? Um, so yeah, um, you can maybe post in the chat if you have an idea how you would go from an organism to, you know, from a sequence only to an organism's name. And I would expect that most of you would say, well, we, we look at the genome of that particular organism and compare it to the amplicon sequencing variant, right? We could actually get the before region from the reference genome from organism and compare it. And that has been done in the beginning of the field quite, you know, that was the standard method. It's not super wrong, but it doesn't necessarily extend. And the main reason is that actually for most bacterial organisms living on Earth, we do not have a good reference genome. Also the reference genomes that we have often come from lab strains of an organism. They might not be representative of the organism that we actually sample from a you know, natural environment. So that we need something that, you know, it's a bit more general. And like, usually what we also wanna do is we actually wanna assign like that down to different taxonomic ranks. Um, so we have like all those um, different ranks, like they usually they go from very unspecific to the domain, like kingdoms, like bacteria or archaea. Um, and then we have all those taxonomic levels that go down to the species. Maybe the finest level we know is the strain. A strain, you know, should be usually mostly a unique genome. And then species have like a genome identity for bacteria. If it, Defining a species is pretty complicated. One way to do it is basically by the identity of genomes and species usually have really similar genomes, far above 95% identity. Um, but yeah, it's a bit debated what a species means for bacteria. And then, like I said, like directly aligning sequence and database of known genes seems most intuitive. It doesn't really work in practice because we don't necessarily have a reference genome for the particular organism or the reference genome is for a lab strain and not necessarily the strain that we sampled from the wild. So a more general method is like a classification method called the multinomial naive base. And the basic idea is, is to say, well, like are there like maybe characteristics of the 16S sequence or the, v, the variable region only in the 16S gene that are kind of conserved across, for instance, a genus or a species. Um, and one thing that you can do is, well, one basic thing that you might know is that bacteria um, are pretty specific in their codon usage. So you know that the genetic code is degenerate, um, meaning that a single amino acid can be encoded by different um, nucleotide codons. Um, and which one is used actually differs a lot between organisms. So that would be one way you could say, oh, well, let's look at the codon usage of the B4 gene, right? Like does it, for instance, prefer certain codons, um, but then might not really work really well for a ribosomal gene, right? It might be better for a protein where that actually has more of an impact, but we can still kind of ask the questions, you know, if we look at like the composition of the sequence, is there maybe certain patterns in it that are really specific? And one easy way to do it is to split up our query sequence in what is called KMERS. Uh, KMERS are just small subsequences from the original sequences, and they usually have a fixed length. So for instance, what I could do is I could choose the three MERS, so all KMERS of length three from my query sequence. So the first one, the first three nuclear ACGs, and I take the next three, like I only shift by one. So I get those four KMERS out of that one sequence. Now I could basically do that for every single input sequence, count it, and kind of I get like a, a table, right? Like all of the KMERS, I get a table for every single sequence. The nice thing is that table, doesn't matter how long the sequence is, I only get a table with all possible KMERS. So it has like a fixed width. And I kind of, kind of could ask, is that profile specific for a certain genus? 
And that I can actually generate from um, reference databases. And that's a bit more general, since I don't really say it has to be you know, a very similar sequence. I just say it's a general composition of using certain k-mers somewhat similar to a particular reference. And that usually generalizes a bit better. So how you generate that is, for instance, you can you know, take a huge database of known reference genomes. For every organism, you kind of do that. You count like the particular streamers or the k-mers, and you count the, pro the proportion in each of the V4 regions, for instance. So for taxon one, the first particular one, you might get, you know, 25% is the ACG, and then you have 25% CGG, and then 50% of the k-mers are the GCG. And you can also take a prior into account if you want, where you kind of say that, oh, well, in that reference database, I have like 100 E. coli genomes. So that's actually really likely to appear in the reference database. So I, you know, the proportion of all sequences in the reference database coming from E. coli, I keep that as a prior. That's the basic probability of just observing that particular taxon in the reference database. And I do that for each of the taxa, and I get those different profiles, which are often called KMR frequencies as well. So now, since those are basically individual probabilities, I can walk through a sequence and kind of just, you know, multiply them out to get the perfect um, the probability. And that's kind of driven by the base. That's why it's called the base multinomial naive space classifier, because it actually used the base theory. So in our reference database, what we know is actually um, the probability of observing a certain chemo giving a certain taxon, right? But we actually want the opposite. Like if I give you a profile, I want to know what's the probability that that profile was generated from a certain taxon or like to put it in probabilistic terms, the question would be what's the probability of the particular taxon given the particular query sequence. And then the base theorem often gives us that nifty trick to actually turn that around. So I can take a probability of observing a particular query given like I already assume a certain taxon and turn it around to get the probability of the taxon. And that's kind of why we use it here. So basically I can use that probability that I have in the reference database to kind of get the probability that my query belongs to a certain taxon. And the basic idea is that I just go through those individual probabilities. Um, I take on the prior term because, you know, if my database is all E. coli, the probability of like, assigning something to E. coli is 100% because that's like what's present in my database. But then, so I should kind of adjust for that maybe. Um, I could, and then I just go through the sequence. So for instance, in our sequence, we had one ACG, two CGC, KMERS, and one GCG. So I would do say, I would say that, oh, the probability on the first taxon is the probability of ACG, which is 0.25. Then it's the probability of CGC, but that will be actually be multiplied two times. So it's like squared. And then the probability of observing the GCG, and I get like a, some probability score here for the first taxon. I can do them for the second taxon and get maybe a lower score. So I would say the probability that that query sequence came from taxon one is higher than it came from taxon two. If I do that for all taxons in the reference database, I can basically rank it and get like um, an assignment based on that. And that's a bit more stable and generalizable. Um, one thing is how do you include that primer? And that's where methods definitely differ. You can completely ignore it and only calculate it and kind of say that each of the taxa in my sample are supposed to be equal. Like I assume as prior information that they are all equally probable. Um, you could say that I think they're as probable as whatever is appearing in the reference database, which might be suboptimal because the reference database might just have a lot of E. coli sequences because it's easy to sequence. It doesn't mean that they actually appear in a lot of environments. Um, and then like newer methods, um, for instance, actually do it based on reference data. So for instance, if you classify a human gut sample, they would adjust the prior based on you know the observed probability observing that species in the human gut, for instance, to maybe increase the classification. But the basic idea is that you use those KMER frequencies as kind of a way to classify them. And that's fairly stable. What you do need every time is you kind of need those KMER frequency pre-calculated for from some reference database. And then you can put in your, your um, amplicon sequencing variance to kind of see what we get out there. So let's assign the taxonomy to our samples as well and do that. So like I said, the first thing we actually need is um, like a database, a classifier, and like it can be downloaded here from Green Genes. Um, we actually use like, so there's a lot of different databases for that. Usually there's a few things to take into account. One thing is 
is a database actually generated from the same variable region that I generated, generated my data from? So that's like a good question to ask, right? Um, because if my KMA frequencies are generated from completely different genes, then maybe it's not that applicable to my own data. In our case, we actually use a database that generated with exactly the same primers, so we're good. Um, then the second one is, you know, how extensive is that reference database? Has it been maintained and so on? And that's definitely good. There's a lot of them out there right now. Um, green genes is a bit outdated at this point. Um, the silver database is definitely much larger and better maintained. Um, and there's also the NCBI reference um, the database, which basically uses 16S sequences from the RefSeq. Um, sequences on the NCBI full genomes, um, which is good if you want to map things, for instance, to the NCBI taxonomy, because Silver has their own taxonomy based on the 16S genes that they observe, but they cover way more organisms since they only look at, you know, organisms that have a complete known 16S gene or the particular region, and they don't really need a full genome like the NCBI data. We actually use green genes. Green genes shouldn't probably be used, like, for your own data. You probably want to use Silver. It's just that it's Obviously, since it's older, it's a smaller database, so it actually will run much faster, and that's why we use it here. And still good enough for like our purposes here. So the first step, what it will do is the WGET will only download that. It's the reference database that has particular KMO accounts for a lot of different organisms, along with their full classification. And then we actually can use the feature classifier, which actually uses that KMO account reference database and our representative sequences, which is the actual sequences of the amplicon variants, and will assign it and save it into a taxa QZA artifact. And that taxa QZA artifact essentially will try to assign a, um, a taxonomic classification for each of our input sequences, if it can find one. It might actually turn up that the the differences in probability are so small, it can't really assign taxonomy, and then it will also tell you that. So that will run for a little bit, um, and will basically do exactly what we said. It will um, go through all of our representative sequences, the amplicon sequencing variants that we had. It will blow it up into the k -mers. It will count the k frequencies, and then use the naive base together with the reference database to assign the probability that a particular sequence came from a particular taxon in the reference database. And that will actually um, kind of quantify the majority of our variants. Like it's always likely that, you know, if you have an organism that has never been observed before, which happens way more often than you might think, especially if you sample from environmental um, sources, like for instance, in the notice or the ocean, um, they might actually, there might be no representatives that we have ever sequenced. Um, so it might be hard to actually assign um, a full taxonomy here. Um, you might get really high level classification, for instance, on the phylum level, but it might not go down, down to the genus level. Things like that happens a lot. Um, and the algorithm takes that into account, like they kind of have classifiers for each of those taxonomic levels, and sometimes it will be able to assign something, sometimes it won't. So you will get different qualities of assignments. For instance, for very, very well-known organisms that whose diversity, um, divergence in the phylogenetic trees were captured by um, the particular variable region, it might actually work out better. Um, for others, it doesn't. So there's definitely like an advantage to do also the analysis that we did before, where we kind of looked at the data just based on amplicon sequencing variants um, without like, like looking into actually what taxons they came from, because we still use all our data. It's a little bit biased here. Here we kind of, if we do any analysis based on the ones that have assigned taxa, it's definitely going to be, you know, limited to those where we can assign a good taxonomy to. So that's definitely that one factor. And that will take a little bit here. It shouldn't take too long um, since we use a smaller database. If you use a silver database, that step can take a bit longer. Um, as always, you might have seen that we add in those parameters called N jobs or N threads, which basically tell you how many CPUs to use to a, for a particular analysis. If you have like a computing server that has, you know, a lot of CPUs, you can definitely ramp them up and you can see it run a little bit faster. But yeah, in our case, it will take a little bit longer. And that will give us assignments of the taxa. Okay, and now if you want, meanwhile, uh, while we're all waiting, if you want to take a wild guess, like, you know, what do you think is kind of the taxonomic resolution of the variable region of the 16S gene? Do you think we will be able to identify individual strains well? Or do you think we will identify different species with that? 
or rather genus, or do you think it was so bad it will barely be able to tell us if it's coming from a bacteria or not? Okay, we get our taxonomy. Um, now maybe we can actually look at it and see what we get, right? So let's try to create a visualization. So one thing that would be interesting is to see what is the composition of taxa actually in each of the samples, right? Like is, for instance, E. coli very high abundant in the ocean or is it not very high abundant in the ocean? And we can do a simple bar plot for that. And we actually kind of use our abundance table from the very beginning, the data two generated. We have our taxonomy assignment. We also put in our metadata so we can kind of order them by that. So as you see, like all the later comments use more and more of the information that we generated previously. Um, that's kind of why this is a pipeline. You have to generate those basic things first. Uh, and we generate a taxa bar plot visualization. And we will look how what that actually looks like. That will be in the top directory. So it will be directly in the materials folder and will be called taxa underscore bar plot to QCV. And again, we can visualize that. So let's refresh it here. I see my taxa bar plot. I download it, go back in the visualization, and again, I open it. That's the taxa bar plot here for me. Okay, so level one, bacteria. Okay, that, that looks pretty good. Like, except for one sample, we it definitely distinguish between bacteria and archaea, and there's a pretty good coverage here. If you look at the taxonomic level, we see that we have it kind of down to level seven. And seven would be species. But if you look at species, we actually see it's weird. It's not that many. Like there is a few, but most of them, if you look at it, have that S underscore underscore empty. There isn't really a species assigned to it at all. So on the species level, we get very few actual assignments. In many cases, you'd see cases like that as well. Like here, it's a bit small, but you basically see it's like O underscore underscore. That means order. F would be family, G would be genus, S would be species, and they're all empty. There's nothing uh, following the underscores, which means it couldn't really assign anything for those sequences. So we see that on the species level, you know, except for some examples, we actually don't really assign species. So like 16S actually doesn't specify or doesn't identify species that well. There's just too little divergence in the 16S gene to really do that well. It is pretty good in the genus, so you will see that for the majority of cases, you actually do get a genus assigned, even though not for all of them, especially not using the green genes database. That's maybe for our cases, since you know we also not great in distinguishing 50 different colors at once, let's limit as at the phylum, which is the second level. And you see that because it starts with like a P dash dash. And you can kind of look at it here and you can actually you know adjust the plot a little bit we have a few samples so we make it a bit wider so we can actually see it a little bit better you do definitely see that between samples there's a lot of differences the most abundant thing seems to be that green thing which in our case are proteobacteria which kind of makes sense a lot of our environments were actually from aerobic environments and proteobacteria like those um but you know there's also different ones bacteroidetes for instance and that's for instance a uh, a particular phylum that's very abundant in the human gut and to kind of see how those match up with the environments they came from we again have that ability to kind of choose what we want to sort the samples by and now instead of sorting them for instance by the phylum we can sort them as well by the source where they came from for instance and now it will kind of annotate so we see that here are the cenote samples from Mexico, and you actually see they're fairly high in proteobacteria, but at least one of the synodes has a massive phyla. That phyla, usually you don't observe like hundreds of phyla in one several sample, so that's like a massive diversity here that happens in the synodes. And that's kind of what we saw on the alpha diversity measures, if you remember, where we kind of saw them to be, like some of them to be very diverse. If you look at the honey gut, honeybee gut microbiome, you actually see they're mostly dominated by proteobacteria, some firmicutes, and maybe some actinobacteria. And that's kind of it on the phylum level there. If you look at the human microbiome, you now kind of start to believe that maybe they are not completely as close to the honeybee gut microbiome because you see that we tend to have very little proteobacteria. 
because we have a really anaerobic gut. Um, proteobacteria can live in anaerobic conditions, um, but usually they get outcompeted by purely aerobic bacteria. And we actually see that, you know, very characteristic signature for the human gut microbiome, which is fairly high bacteroidetes and firmicutes percentages. That's a major taxa that we have in the human gut. And it's definitely different from the ocean. In the ocean, you actually see an enrichment in cyanobacteria, which are basically bacteria that can, can convert like, you know, sunlight into and fixate carbon using that, um, which is essential, pretty much expected for you know, organisms living in the ocean because they're very carbon limited and like um, fixating carbon dioxide is definitely necessary there. But also we see some bacteria, do this sometimes some proteobacteria. And then finally, if you look at the soil, we actually see the acidobacteria are definitely very specific to soil here as a phylum. And we definitely have high levels of actinobacteria, but also verruca microbia. And again, some proteobacteria as well. So there's definitely certain signatures here that you see that are really scaling with the environment. Okay, nice. So maybe do we're almost done. So that's kind of, we generated quite a bit of insight here. We, we saw how the microbiota composition varies across those environments. We identified some of the environments that are, have high alpha diversity. Um, we saw those really clear taxonomic signatures as well for certain environments. And maybe let's look at that a little bit more. And let's do like one quick example, just how do you actually pull out data from Chang2? Since we, you know, you saw that we always have to go that path from an artifact to a visualization to actually end up with something that we can visualize. But sometimes you might just be interested in getting the raw data for your own analysis. So let's do an example where I say, I actually wanna have that matrix of genus abundances across all samples. And I wanna pull it out and maybe, you know, do a plot with my own Python code. So like, that's kind of an, one thing we can do. So first, our abundances are still on the levels of individual amplicon sequencing variants. So we will summarize them on the genus. So basically every, for every sample, we look at all the amplicon sequencing variants that are one particular genus, Bacteroides, for instance, and we sum up the counts. So if we have like one variant with 10 counts, one with 20 would be 30 counts for that genus and so on. So that's the first thing we can do. So we add in our abundance table, our taxonomy table. We say that our level, like the level of the taxonomy you want to cut out or collapse at is six. Six is the genus level. Um, you can use that kind of pyramids that we showed before. And we generate a genus, genus QCA artifact. Again, Chime 2 only converts artifacts to artifacts, right? So we, again, we have an artifact. It's still not what we want. We want some table, some text file we can actually read. We do that in a two-step process. There's an export comment in, Ch in Chime that kind of exports the actual file format so we can run that. And then we use an additional comment to convert it to a TSB table. And that's only necessary in our case because um, abundance tables in Chime are kind of saved in a binary format called biome which is like a good format for like biological matrices, but we want it in a normal tab separated file table. So if you look at that exported folder here, maybe updating, oh, here it is. You see that it gen only, you know, extracted that biome table from the Chime artifact. That is actually already like, you know, one significant step because we got it out of the Chime format into whatever native data formats they're stored in that. And then we converted it to a tab separated file. And that can just be read and, Here's a small example. Let's assume, for instance, we want to do like a heat map of that and maybe also try a different normalization method that Chime doesn't provide. And it's like not important to understand that code 100%. Um, we walk through it, but like it's only to illustrate that you can actually get that data out into your own analysis pipelines or visualization pipelines if you kind of want to do that. So um, let's do that. So we have. Um, we will import a few libraries. And the first thing we actually do is we use pandas, which is a Python library to read a lot of tabular formats. So we read the abundances on the genus level. Um, there's a comment row on top that we will ignore. We don't care about the index that much either. Um, then we actually separate it, for instance, by the genus name, uh, by the taxonomy name. So we only use the genus name here. We basically we split up that particular naming string that if you remember looked like this here, it was like kind of all the levels of the taxonomy are separated by semicolons. So we can, for instance, split that up in our codes and we can you know, filter only the ones that have actually have an assigned genus. We don't really care about 
sequencing or abundances for genera that you know have no genus assigned we use for instance only the first 100 of those and you know we do a different normalization this time we actually don't rarify it we still you know the genus count still have the same problem that they might be higher for samples that have higher total reads um so what we do here is essentially a trick where we do a log ratio transform and that's different a log ratio transform doesn't actually you know subsample the data it's like just a transformation that makes that um effect of the sequencing depths kind of less important and the major trick is that you log transform all the data and then you subtract the mean that's the main effect why is that important well because the effect of the library death is mostly a multiplicative effect so for instance if you sequence like a particular sample 10 times deeper than all the rest then every single count of original organism would be increased tenfold so it's like a a factor that's multiplied with every single read count so if we log transform it well a product becomes a sum and then if we subtract the mean we actually subtract the library size away so that's kind of the ideal idea there's some caveats to that but it kind of works so it will kind of you know normalize away the library effect size and we will see that a little bit and then we use some really nifty pandas magic to kind of apply that log transform for every single gene uh, for every single sample sorry um you kind of get rid of that one problem is that we can't log transform the zero because that's not really defined so we add like a pseudo count of 0 0.5 which is like something smaller than one so it's less than one particular read observed which isn't really possible so it's like a decent way um and then finally we use seaborn to you know do a visualization which is like the heat map for it so kind of it's just an example like you know we we pulled out the raw data we did a bunch of transformations on it and then we kind of visualized it as well and we did that all outside of chime here so we basically use just normal python code but you could also use r or whatever other environment you use even import it into excel and do visualizations there um that's kind of how that looks like um so basically now the rows will again group together samples that are somewhat similar in that transformed space. Um, the columns will group together sample um, particular, sorry, genera that appear very co-appear in different samples. And you kind of see that really nice kind of block structure here where particular genera only appear in a certain set of samples. And you can actually, if you wanted, you could check out, use the metadata table and check out what those samples came from. From and you would see that you know every three rows is basically a new environment and we could even try to do some detective work here and try to figure out what it is so um let's maybe start with the lowest one here we have a lot of these sulfi bacca retrobacter the sulfi microspira looks a little bit it's like definitely a fairly like separated environment um so we could kind of maybe it's either like since it has that much like very different genera maybe it's a synode or maybe you know it's a soil as well so we could kind of check out one of the ids four four five and maybe go back to our metadata table that we had in the beginning and actually check it out so four four five is definitely that last group here and it is the synote, so it was the sinkhole, for instance. And then, you know, some of them are fairly easy to find out. For instance, here you have Ruminococcus, Prevotella, and that is Rosaburia, Alistipus. Those are, if you work with human gut microbiome, you always see those phyla. They're like, very, uh, on those genera, they're very abundant in the human gut microbiome. So that's definitely human gut microbiome. The one that has very few genera and high abundances seems to be an environment that has, in general, like very, few unique taxa and that's actually the honey bee gut microbiome and so on and you could you know if you have some background knowledge about the microbiome those environments you can probably identify a particular environment just from that okay so we actually finished at this point we kind of went through like the entire list of things that we wanted to do so like just to summarize we went from raw sequencing data we quality controlled the sequencing data we recovered you know the most likely original sequences of the variable region of the 16s gene we even assigned taxonomy we talked a little bit about how to normalize that um we did a lot of analysis on diversity we visualized them and we created some insights here like you know, for instance, seeing that the honeybee get microbiome seems to, you know, contain very few unique taxa. Um, it's also very different from the human gut microbiome. Also getting some idea that uh, the cenotes sinkholes in Mexico have like an extremely rich diversity. 
And now basically it's up to you. So we kind of, you know, was a lot of information today. We gave you a lot of tools and now it's obviously like a good point to familiarize yourself with those tools. So first we have like two little exercises for you. So um, one is like sample classification, which is basically, you know, we kind of saw that visually, it seems like we could actually identify the environment just from the composition, the genus level composition. So now it's like up to you to actually show that actually works and be a bit more strict about it. And we will basically, both of those exercises work in a way that they will use like a plugin of Chime that they haven't used up to now in the course. And I will only have you add in a few different inputs. Um, like we said before, if you want to, you know, actually read up on what, how a particular plugin works, you can always go to the Chime 2 docs. Like docs.chime2.org is the address, and it's also linked in the notebook and in the slides. So, and then they have that subject in the docs, which Docs, which are plugins, and you can, for instance, look at, um, so instance, a sample classifier plugin, and will explain you what that plugin is for. It will take you pipelines and methods and things like that. Um, so you can look at a particular step on action, and will actually give you a good documentation what is needed as an input, what's the type, and then you can try running it and see if you can figure out what goes into the. Um, in, the missing areas. And then we have a few questions where you will actually generate a visualization based on that and then draw some conclusions. So in the first exercise, we will ask you to kind of, you know, try to um, see if you actually can predict the environment just from the composition of the um, community composition of the particular microbiome. And the second one, we actually have you generate a tree with much more rich annotations. So you can also look at the phylogeny of all the amplicon sequence invariants and see if that kind of lines up with different environments or if there's other factors. And you will also be able to identify what those really far away variable regions in the 16 estuaries were. When you remember in the tree, we saw that there's some really long branches where it had some nodes which seem to be very different from all the other amplicon sequencing variants. So you will be able to look at that a little bit. And that will be kind of, you know, exercises you can do. And we will post solutions to those, but just we will probably wait a few days so that people that couldn't join live can still have that chance to actually do them without being bombarded by the replies immediately. Um, so you will have a time to do them on your own and can ask us, of course, again, questions. We will be available even, you know, after the course has ended, if you want to do them a bit later and, you know, check those out. And then we also have a little bonus for you. So thanks to our sponsors, we actually this year can do a project challenge, um, which is like a small chance for you to win you know, some swag from the ISP. So basically um, we will send you a t-shirt wherever you live. Um, and the way that works is um, we actually will have you only use the tools that you learned today. So we will have you create a figure and the figure rules are basically, it has to be a figure that only uses Chime 2 visualizations. So you can basically generate, you know, visualizations try to create some insights that maybe we haven't looked at in the course. There's some information in the metadata, for instance, you could look at, or you could come up with your own kind of hypothesis that you want to test or a particular aspect of the data we haven't looked at at all. Maybe you have a favorite organism you want to kind of check out. Um, and basically you will, you know, you can use any um, imaging editing software, like generate a few of the visualization, like for instance, like a bar plot or whatever, you can screenshot it or most of the things also have, you know, downloads where you can actually download the particular image, assemble that into, um, oops, let's go back to my slides, into a particular visualization. And then kind of create a caption for that, um, describe what you have, you know, we can see in the image and also choose a region. So we will actually not only give away like a single set of t-shirts, we actually will give away um, t-shirts to winners of all different geographical regions. And we use um, the U and geo regions for that with some adjustments, which you can also find in the challenge channel on Slack. It actually has like more specification of the rules and more details there, what you can use. And the basic idea is that you choose the geographical region you most identify with, and then you will participate in that particular region to win a t-shirt. Um, so the rules are also that you can have no more than four panels on the figures. So, you know, you don't generate it's a bit hard to maybe grok a figure with like a hundred sub panels. Um, and then, you know, will everything will be taken into account and it gives you a chance to kind of, you know, 
practice what you learned in the course, but also like actually do it to win something in the process. So and there's a link here on the slides, but also you can just basically you submit them in the Slack channel for the project submissions. And you will basically can upload the image and the text, you write the caption and the regions you want to participate in. And then we will consider that. Um, you can also, you know, comment on other submissions from users, tell them how awesome the figures they made, and we will kind of pick a few winners at the end, maybe around one to two weeks from now, maybe two weeks, so you have some time, um, which will bring us close to the end of October, um, and then we will notify the winners. So that's like an extra chance, thanks to our sponsors, to get something out of it. And yeah, that's pretty much brings us to the end for today. I hope it was kind of useful. Um, it is a lot of information, but all the materials are still there. So feel free to go through them. Um, we try to fill in a lot of text also in the notebooks, which you can go through and read and get some additional information. The slides are obviously still there and they will always remain there. Um, so there's a lot of like chances to go through it on your own pace again, kind of absorb everything. Um, and practice it as well. The Colab notebooks you can run forever. They will not expire or anything, or there won't be a time where you can't run them anymore. Um, and I really want to stress also that, you know, all of that is like super dependent on like an amazing team that we had here at the ISB. That is, there's so much going on under the hood here. And even with the small hiccups we had here, I think it's like easy to forget how much work goes into all of that. So I want to thank everybody that participated here, like in making that event great. and. Also want to thank you, like all the people that came here it was like really amazing to see that, you know, very global community coming together here and learning a little bit about it. And tomorrow we'll actually switch gears a little bit um, and we'll look at full genomes from isolates um, from the human gut and actually do like create some metabolic models for them and actually create some ecological insights there. So that will be fun as well. And we'll also use analysis that haven't been done before. So thanks so much, everybody. And yeah, I hope you have a awesome rest of the day or if you have watched the recording i hope it was useful and let us know in the slack chat if you need anything thanks so much and yeah we'll follow that up with some closing remarks um, by sean gibbons who will join us now and thanks so much and i see you tomorrow There we go, I'm unmuted. Um, thanks to Christian so much for all of his work today, uh, teaching the course. Thanks to all of you for, for joining us. Uh, that wraps up day one. Uh, we've got a full course day tomorrow and then a symposium to follow on Friday. Uh, I wanna again, thank our sponsors for making this all possible. Illumina, Thorn Health Tech and the Washington Research Foundation. Um, Again, we're a nonprofit research organization uh, providing this, this free resource to the community. Um, if you have the means and the desire, uh, we are accepting donations to help support this kind of work. So you can go to our course website and down at the bottom, there's a little button you can push there to, uh, to, to maybe throw us a little bone there. Um, so to kind of recap the day, uh, you know, we just sort of did that, but you know, hopefully a lot of you got the basic tools you need um, to do Amplicon sequencing data analysis, right, which is kind of the bread and butter of a lot of microbiome research. Um, in particular, we introduced you to Chime 2, this uh, very popular software ecosystem, which includes functions for processing, analyzing, and visualizing data. Uh, and now that you have these tools at your fingertips, we've challenged you to build compelling figures and post them uh, along with figure captions and your geographic region uh, to the course uh, channel on Slack or to the challenge channel. We'll have to, we'll have to figure that out. Uh, we'll let you know. You'll have one week or say about two weeks to submit a figure. Uh, our TA judges will choose winners for each region. Um, and, uh, and then we'll send you a t-shirt for those, those of you who win. Um, again, if you would like to share your experiences uh, in the course and in the symposium, please use the has hashtag uh, ISB microbiome 21. Um, and you can tag ISB itself at ISB Sci. Uh, we're looking forward to hosting you again tomorrow for day two of the course, where you'll learn about metabolic modeling uh, of gut bacterial isolates and how to infer something about their ecology from these models. Uh, we'll kick things off at 9 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow. Uh, we hope to see you there. Um, 
please learn more about ISB at our website, ISBScience.org. And uh, thanks again. Uh, that, that does it for today. Bye, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.